Hello everyone. Good morning. It's another Thursday and it's time for Unplugged. And I'd like to welcome you once again to another edition of Still Very Well Made in Nigeria. Welcome and thank you everybody for joining. I want to also specially thank those who have joined um, our Unplugged Julia Jacks Consulting and Unplugged community between October and November. There have been so many of you and um, thank you very much. Um, watch, watch this space for more information on things that we have planned that are specifically for our community. Well, maybe not so specifically, but definitely you're going to have first dibs on it. I promise you. I promise you. So here we are again today talking to another brand that is really focused on excellence and making things extremely well made in Nigeria. And before we start, let me just ask you, please, you're already following us, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on um, uh, <laughs> IG, Instagram, and Facebook. I tend to forget where we are. Yeah, Instagram and Facebook and or at Julia Jacks Consulting. I will say it again. Please subscribe, like, and set your notifications for Julia Jacks Consulting on YouTube and Kindly follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Julia Jacks Consulting. So we have someone here today who I would say is a very good friend of mine. Well, I won't say it. She is a very good friend of mine. How did I make so many good friends? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. But I, I, I think I've just opened and it's, it's a blessing. I am really, really blessed to have all these great people in my life. I'd like to introduce you guys to our guest for today. She is um, called Chef Jules. She is a 10-speed bike who is operating as a 10-speed bike. She does so many things, all within the certain ambit of baking. She's somebody who started off... Um, as a pastry chef who is no longer just a pastry chef. And I'd like to bring her online right now so you can join me to welcome her. Chef Jules, okay. She's, <laughs> she's talking to us out of her bakery. Chef Jules, welcome, welcome, welcome to Unplugged. Thank you so much, Aunt Julia, for having me. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today, everyone. It's gonna be exciting. I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> It's really going to be exciting. So I'd like to read your, um, your um, I I'll call it a really condensed version of um, your bio. <laughs> Chef Jules is the current governor of the TCN Entrepreneurs uh, Accountability Group and the current Eco Chef Chocolate Chef Challenge winner, which she's going to tell us all about, you know. This founder of Buff Bakeries, Limited owns three brands, three, not one, three, three, three brands, Cake Flair, Buff Bistro, and Chef Jules Africa, which she's also going to tell us about. She's an award-baking baker, a high art sugar crafter, a wholesome food advocate, a reformer, I dare add, dare say add, um, advocate, entrepreneur, who is versed in recipe creation, food business development, and commercial food processing. She's a multiple award winner across the food industry and believes that baking business can be wholesome, systemized to run on autopilot, and sustainably scaled. While Chef Jules' products are sold in leading formal retail outlets in Nigeria, She's also judiciously working towards scaling into continental frontiers. Chef Jules is passionate about food, eager to make a difference, and is creating a paradigm shift from traditional baking methods to efficient, easy DIY baking processes. That in a very small nutshell is Chef Jules, but we are going to now start unpacking everything. So guys, Welcome, welcome. Chef Jules, I could give you a minute to share the link if you want. Okay, yes, that's what I'm trying to do here while you were reading the... Okay. So I can give you a minute to do that. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, they aren't saying they're listening. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, and guys, those of you who are on already, please could you um could you share the link and um like us on YouTube at Julia Jackson Consulting. I'm 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 gonna just put it here, eh? So it's um Julia Jacks Consulting on Facebook um, IG and YouTube. Yes. We just give you high minutes so she can. <laughs> you have a long broadcast list. Oh my oh. word. <laughs> I hope all the cake makers, entrepreneurs, and um, all my people just want to do things better. Yes, all, everybody who wants to do business better. Yeah, please join us. This this one promises to be really great. Yeah. Yes, I'm done. Okay. Okay, so we're good to go. Jules, you're still... Let, let the others yeah, share, please. I'm, I'm done, I'm done. Okay, okay. yes, that's the last one. <laughs> okay. Yay, Patricia is joining, yes! so we um we met about two 20 about 20 years ago oh my goodness i'm old yeah. <laughs> you are and so am i <laughs> i think it was a little a little over 20 years ago because um yes. you were really young then yeah a little over 20 years ago Still trying to find my you know. path you know trying to discover mm. the true identity <laughs> absolutely but that's also a journey that all of us are on we, we don't stop that journey until until the day we um we die that true identity yeah. thing but what what interests me is um at this point is how you moved from um baking cakes to sugar craft to being a wholesome food advocate just just talk us through that journey that process what mm. um what catalyzed each stage what i mean it seems like it was a domino effect one yeah. led to the other to the other so you were a baker then you went into high art sugar crafter i know at the time you went to was it france to to study uh, uh, chicago your, so your craft chicago. Chicago, was it in Chicago? Yeah. Okay, all right. I know there was a French thing in that. And then you moved into being um, a wholesome food advocate and a reformer advocate entrepreneur. So talk us through those different stages. How, how did you get to that journey? Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here, to be talking with the, I call the almighty Julia Oku. <laughs> She's actually the O in the S O and U for those who know, and uh, it's a, she's my mentor. We've known her for over twenty years, and I'm truly elated to actually be here, um, allowing her unplug me, as it were. Okay, so I started cake flair as a pastime, pretty much. It was more a hobby. I just loved baking and the rest of it, and we didn't even used to bake in my house. It was just a neighbor that just perceived the aroma of a baked cake, and that kind of trigger the seizure, like, you know what, I don't do this. So it became a business because uh, someone actually paid for a wedding cake that was actually my salary. 
<laughs> myself, ah, ah, if I can pay my salary with one wedding cake job, this is something I can actually take seriously and focus on. And don't get me wrong, I wanted to make plenty of money. I don't think it's wrong. When I ask people what you want to do, they say, oh, I want to make a difference. Yes, we all know that. But we also want to make money because without Absolutely. money, you can't give onto every good work. You need money to make a difference. You need money to actually be able to create options for yourself so you can make a difference. So I wanted to do something that would work my while. I'll be, I'll be able to enjoy and be able to also make money from. So it was more like a, they're, they're not in conflict, they're in perfect harmony, pretty much. So I started baking and then I realized that I was really deficient with core sugar craft skills. And that's what already commands the coins. People like to pay for a cake that reflects their ulcer ego or something that speaks to their fantasy. So I thought, okay, how best can I hone my skills and be a blessing in this area or just make a difference? So I actually went through some of the top names in Nigeria at the time to learn sugar crafting. I took classes and the more I took the classes, the more I wanted more. I just kept going for more. So I moved from just baking to sugar crafting when I came back from Chicago. I just said to myself, Julia, do this thing very well. Don't just be half baked. If you want to do it, do it 100% to go the full distance. So I started working from home for about 11 years, actually. As I was holding my skills, any job that came, I didn't even have a target market at that time. It was any job, just jump in there. Let's be like a way of building your profile and your skill set. So it was more of building myself up. It wasn't more of even trying to target a particular uh, market segments. So I got to a point where you do the job and then someone even appreciates it and someone not want to pay so well. I said to myself, no, I know segments who you're actually focusing on. So I, um, I set up my bakery, that was like six years ago. And I said, I'll do what they call a tiered uh, product. So I have the high end and then I, and I have the, it's like a mix, I call it a product offering mix or something like that. So I have the high end and I have the cash cow. So that's the high end jobs, I get in, involved in it. And then the cash cow ones, I've already trained people who can just take up, pick up the phone, take an order and execute the cakes. So I said to myself, because at that time when I even traveled, it was a struggle to leave the business 100% and focus on classes. And I said, how can I run this business without being there all the time? And once I asked myself that question, it's like my brain went to work to try and figure out how to solve that problem, which was to start creating recipes. So what I did was I split recipe into two, dry and wet. And so I give my staff the wet and I pre-mix the dry because the drier ones can have a longer shelf life than if you break your eggs, can't leave your eggs for more than two hours. So I did the pre-mixes and <laughs> that was... That was the tipping point. I said, oh my goodness, one can actually scale a business if you can just, you know, put an IP around the dry mix and then give them the other one. So once they combine them together, they're able to come up with the, the cake with the same precision, like I was the one baking it from start to finish. So that was why I, I did that. So for me to actually do sugar crafts, can I continue? Yes, please. Okay. To do sugar craft to the points where I can travel and then leave my stuff to it, I have to also be able to keep my books to know how many cakes do I do in a week, how many chocolate cakes, how many uh, red velvet cakes. So it gave me um, insight into answering those questions because if I go away and they run out of red velvet cake mix, I'm in trouble. So I have to start keeping books to do historical data of January, how many do we sell? So when I'm doing for, say, April, I'll do like maybe I'll do a median, an average of the three and just add a little more to it and say, okay, our target for the month is we must make this number of cakes for the month. So I realized that I was able to make decisions using numbers. And so any month that I exceed my expectation, we celebrate it and say, whoa, we get out. So I don't try to just bake for fun. I try to also <laughs> bake for couples. <laughs> like, you know, you have to pay the bills. And a lot of us, you know, do struggle as bakers to use the business to pay bills because we just say it's a passion and that passion can kill you if you don't start adding numbers to you know making decisions about it because just, just there making the cake you love making the cake and then when it comes to paying bills you're struggling so i just said to myself i want this business to be able to pay its own bills so how would it what would it take so i did what they call contribution ratio, contribution ratio where you calculate the products you're selling how much you need to make to meet up with your indirect costs as your rent, your salaries. I take a salary 
Sometimes business owes me, but I must take a salary. Sometimes could you, could you slow down? Salary. Could you slow down a little bit? <laughs> could you slow down a little bit? I think people okay. no 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 people would like to know um contribution ratio, but let me ask you a, yes. a question, which I, I, I think you you will will bring that naturally in. Um you've talked about being thirsty for knowledge and, and it's really clear. What triggered you to go for this test, apart from the fact that you wanted to be free? And where did you get this? Do you, in short, the question is, who was speaking in your ear? What did you see that made you feel, I can do better by learning how to do better? And where did you go to learn how to do better? Mm. Okay, well, uh, let me say, um, that's a very deep question, Nancy. <laughs> um, because you're one of those people who spoke to me that oh, okay. you said something, I'm sure I don't remember you said that, <laughs> and I wrote it down. You said, are you ready? Not just willing. And that uh, for me to make a difference, I have to be interdependent with people, not codependent on them. I don't think you remember you said that to me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so wise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting to buy a book, really, you know. So, and, and people around me were one of the people that kind of made me thirsty for, uh, thirsty for excellence. Because, you know, when I see people like you, people like uh, Kobe, Benzi, Enchil, you know, you know, and there are people who ask me questions that make me think deeply. And I said to myself, Juliet, you can do this. So for me, it was more like... Um, like a seizure, I can't even explain it. It just drives me. I'm just driven to want to know. I'm curious, sort of, and I feel like I'm the kind of person that if you tell me don't do this, my natural response is why. So if I feel, if I also feel like I can't question things, if I also go investigate them or find out for myself what it is, I like to also be authentic with the answers as opposed to just figuring out what someone has said to me. So for me, the drive for knowledge. I can't explain it. So I think it's just in my DNA to want to know. Maybe I'm also a type A personality, really. You know, I think it was a bad thing to always be like curious. You know how they say in Africa, you talk too much, you are too forward. All those things can actually hold you back as a person. If uh, you're supposed to actually be a curious person, you're supposed to actually be an innovator, a reformer. That means you have to be forward. You have to be forward. you have to see. Go where no one has gone. And so they say, yeah, come back. You don't allow yourself to be restricted by the social conditioning that happens even from our well-meaning family and friends you know so for me i just said to myself you know just keep going uh don't allow the narrative of the past shape you know uh how you project for the future just learn from it and then recreate yours and i think also um yeah i think it's an african thing that really when they tell you this is how you should operate you know all those things I struggle with those things. I always find myself trying to um, be free. I think my greatest or primary objective for even doing business or anything is freedom. I want to be free to have the power of choice, free to create options. I enjoy the idea of being free. And with that freedom comes responsibility. You know, that's why I know that, okay, if you're free without taking that extra effort to be responsible to things, it means you're, you're, you're reckless, and I don't want to be reckless. I want to make sure that I'm able to impact those coming around me and also be a blessing to those, you know, in my circle of influence as well. I want to also make a difference. I don't know, it just drives me pretty much so. And I feel like in trying to unravel who I am, the journey was taking me in different places. It was almost like a meandering journey. You know, when the flow of a river is impeded, what happens? It redirects. So I see myself like... A river redirect, flowing, yeah. you know, and so I just kind of redirect through all of that, and I can connect all the dots. I know it's like in perfect harmony, taking me in another direction, and that's why when I look back at all the failures in my life, I celebrate them because they were actually the nuggets for the success that I also experienced on the journey. So nothing really was wasted, you know, and I'm really happy and blessed to be in this position right now. I feel somehow, without sounding too arrogant. Like I'm in the center of the will of God for my life right now because I just seem to enjoy what I'm doing. I can decide not to go to work, which was something I never could do before. I can just stay at home and just watch Netflix all day. I can just carry my laptop, think new ideas. So one of the things that being able to run a business and also pilot gives you is the ability to be able to think 
And once you can think, you find yourself able to now make your product a problem-solving product. And that's why we have this six range of cake mixes. We have one, ones for diabetics, the ones for those who are intolerant to gluten, and then we have the decadent range as well. And for those who even have ovens in their homes, we have the pancake mixes that they can also use for their power breakfast and like so. So for me, it was more like responding to my environment and trying to be in alignment. And as I try to align, I think the universe conspires in my favor to make these things come to bear because I always try to ask the right questions. What is going on? How do I solve this? How do I solve that? And also in dealing with my own staff as well, I try not to instruct them beyond the manual that we already have. I just question them. So in questioning them, we also also hear their answers and see if they are also aligning the vision and also able to you know, go the full distance with me. Okay, so we've heard so many things from you, and um, I, I want to um, trouble a few of them, and that is um, uh -huh. social conditioning, because it affects, that's one of them, and um, the idea of um, freedom, and then mm. responding to the environment. We, we talked, um, you and I have spoken about social conditioning and how it can hold a person back. Now, how would it could it hold back an entrepreneur? Because I believe a lot of entrepreneurs are are held back and stay small, especially growing yeah. businesses. They stay small because of social conditioning, and that prevents them from going for loans. Uh, it prevents uh, them from having a proper board. It prevents them from um, seeking investors. So, can you speak to that? How um, social conditioning affects? The entrepreneurial yes. growth yeah i mean in the last few years we've seen a lot of changes in many women shattering the glass ceilings you know we see what even women is doing people like uh, i mentioned some names i'm sorry <laughs> people like singing what we go you know people like awashika yeah. and many of them i can't even mention 20 years ago i can't mention names like that you know but i can see that a lot of things are happening even the global stage women are now taking more positions of authority and influence and power, which wasn't so. So I think for me, what I see is where women are told that your place is in the kitchen, you know, and so because of that, just be a missus and that's the, the achievements that should make you feel respectable in society, you know, as good as it is to have that, that should not just be the limitation that one should put on oneself. One should be able to express what they call um, purpose. So there are things that drive people. And I feel like many times, because we're told in Africa that a woman's place in the kitchen or she'll be under her husband or, and those things, you know how, I don't know, who, someone said, okay, you, you, you go to school and then get married, get, get a good job and, and that's it for a woman. You know, it, it was as if our parents were even confused. You want your kids to be the very best, but then you still want them to, to still, you know, they, they, they couldn't really let go. Because I, I also went through that, my dad was like, okay, uh, why not wait? This business idea thing is great, but why not? But when you get married, you know, your husband can do it. You know, it sounds so great, you know, but what if the husband is not an entrepreneur? <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, exactly. So for me, the issue is I'm grateful to God that I even have parents who also questioned me to some extent and allowed me to express myself. But at the point, they actually limited me to out of love and fear, not out of trying to hold me back, you know. And I told my dad, I said, Daddy, I'm still young. Even if I make a mistake, I, I, I can live with my own mistake. I'd rather experiment, fail, because it's my mistake or my opinion, than play safe, go with you, and now fail, and now realize that ah, I should have just gone my own way. I think I can live with my own failures than to just <laughs> create or live my life on a, as an extension of your life, you know? He said, hmm, okay. My dad was very understanding, actually. <laughs> it was my mom that was in, like, ah. Yes, you're not a man, you know. Yeah, you want so, and, and I understand where all that is coming from because she was conditioned like that and she enjoyed her life like that. But I was going to enjoy for me. I'm not looking for, security but that works or, for some people, yes, for some. Yes. But for me, you were, you were, I was looking for security, that works for some for people. people, yeah. Yes, I was looking more for opportunity than for security, you know. For her, you know, she had the security of my wonderful father, like my, my father, who was, you know, for me, I, I wanted to express myself, I found more joy expressing who i am than just conforming to a set of unspoken rules you know and let me leave that because i don't want to go into too much 
all of that, you know. Uh, yeah. Social... <laughs> I actually yes. did try to make sure that I live but, my but life. But I think the point you're making, the point you're making is that we should be um, careful as entrepreneurs and brand builders, we should be careful about and sensitive to the conditioning that can keep us small. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yes. So and, how and do you have to go for those especially... loans and get a board and get investors? Okay. Number one, I tried to, when I was only looking for my board of directors, uh, women lost the long one is also my board of directors. I mean, I was looking for women who have made a difference, you know, and I balance it, you know, at least two women and two guys, you know, power, I mean, high, uh, power driven or high, how do I call it now? High, high achievers, people who really want to make a difference in their space as well. I feel like they will have a, like a big picture perspective to how, you know, actually making decisions. And they also showed me how they were running their own businesses too. And they were also very vulnerable about their mistakes and their humanity. And I see if I'm going to be a, a great leader, I have to be vulnerable. I have to let people see me for who I am, not just uh, be acting all perfect as well. So I am grateful to God that I have such a board that can actually give insight. When we talk on phone and we share knowledge and share experiences, I also see how they live their lives, how they also play hard. I mean, when we do scuba diving, all of us, I'm like, wow, scuba diving. You know, so I try to see what they are doing and take from their lives principles that they have, you know, kind of enacted and now make it my own without trying to replicate their lives in mine, but use their, 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 those nuggets as, you know, tipping point and seeds to kind of grow and nurture mine so that I see myself that when I'm crushed, I'm not depleted, but I'm like the oil that comes, you know, comes out from the seeds but when i'm plucked like a fire you know comes like there's this fragrance you know so at every point in time these people have shaped me and that's why it's so difficult for me to just even though i have my own strong opinions i also try to be open-minded so when they say things around me i try to take it in and say okay how does this translate for me as a business owner as a brand because you know i don't really eat uh the uh the gluten-free cake i don't i don't i don't eat it because i'm a pro gluten person i'm not anti or gluten free person no, but i have people in my family who cannot even eat that product so i can't just say ah this is well with you or just say one thing i say oh how can i help this person solve the problem like my dad was diabetic before he died <laughs> you know i had to make how can my dad was he lived on a very restricted diet don't eat this don't eat that this was diabetic and i saw how it actually affected him his moods and everything but that was an easy go was an easy going person but because of all the restrictions, you don't really eat cake. Eat, ah. So I just said to myself, the roll of cakes in one's life, I, I don't call it junk food, I call it soul food because it's something that should just give you hot for a while. And you know, the wisest man on earth, King Solomon said, he said, refresh me with apples. So was feeding me cakes of raisins because I'm love sick. So you see, there is a part of our <laughs> lives that we need to have some records of abandon attitude too and that's just you know feeling good with ourselves and that comes from things eating like cakes cake is not food it's just a snack that you can just use to feel good and, and that's the place so i feel i want to change the narrative from seeing cakes as something that is dirty junk not not healthy and then see how we can also tweak it a little bit because sugar is the major culprit uh -huh. you know the flour sugar butter eggs are the notorious bad boys <laughs> of the food industry <laughs> so i call them the fantastic four how can we do that i want things to do it's power of flour, flour that's been depleted with all this processing and all that, power it up. And then uh, sugar too, we try to replace sugar with coconut nectar. Nigeria is the world's 18th producer of coconuts. And yet, you know, in the whole of West Africa, we don't even have a coconut sugar processing plants anywhere. So what I did was I tried to see how we can bring that into Nigeria by exploring uh, already existing best practices in Southeast Asia, like Philippines, and uh, Thailand and Indonesia. So what we'll be able to do is look at how they actually extract coconut nectar from the trees and see how can we do that here in Nigeria as well. So I actually went to Laskoda, met with the GM to see how we can come together and find a way to start tapping the nectar from coconut trees to convert that to sugar. And the sugar that you get from coconut nectar has a GI of 35 glycemic index which does not spike up your blood sugar level if you're diabetic compared to regular sugar that does that. That one has a GI of 65, which is so high. So I said, okay, how can we do this? And we discovered that there's no culture of coconut cultivation in Nigeria. 
on like palm wine where you can tap it. But the coconut trees are not <laughs> farmers are meant to live in, with those trees, like a Tongia farming system where you live with the trees every two hours, you go and tap the nectar and then convert that to sugar. We don't have that kind of culture here. For you to actually do that successfully here in Nigeria, you have to have the tree uh, growers be able to live with the trees. They have the climbers, the tappers, the dryers. It's like a whole range of it's like, a whole value chain. The value chain for you to actually get that product. Yeah. So it's just me just having the idea alone. Yes, you know. So we started the journey. The process is a slow one. I wish I can, I can go faster with it, but you know, I'm only as strong as my weakest link. So what we try to do is work those areas where we have issues, policy making as well. We also feel like our policy makers have to do a lot better. Don't just make policies in ivory towers. Come down to the jungle, meet the farmers, meet the what they call smallholder farmers, find ways to help them improve farming practices. So people like us can say, Oga, oh grow this tree, tap, I will buy from you and uh, sap uh, the nectar for me. Because now, even if you sap the nectar, who is going to buy it on a commercial scale? Because the farmer has to plant, cultivate the trees, make sure they produce the nectar, and then be able to also convert it for me. Because I'm not a farmer, I'm just a user of a you know, intermediate products, so a finished product called Nutri-Sap, which is my award-winning cake mix for diabetics. However, if I'm not able to grow enough quantities, there's no way I can meet my contribution ratio yet again to meet that bottom line that helps me pay my bills. So it's a whole world connected, it's like a ripple effect, both from the farmers, from the government, and maybe entrepreneur. And I feel like many of us, we are so stuck into our businesses, trying to do daily hustle, or buying and selling, and just making paying bills. We need to sometimes take a step back and see, in my space, in the ecosystem I operate, how can I, what can I do differently to make things better? You know, I actually called on uh, Fiman, that's the uh, Flower Man Miller's Association of Nigeria, yes. And I said, why can't you guys also develop other variants of wheat that we can grow locally as opposed to importing wheat? In 2018, government increased tariff for wheat importation by 20%. That means that if you are a baker who bakes bread, you will shut down that bakery mm -hmm. because commercial uh, price of bread was completely thrown off the tangent because by the time you buy your flour at that uh, hiking percentage, what, what, what it means is that you either increase your price or you change your recipe. And what's been going on in the bread industry right now, and I'm saying this out here because this is really a very tricky matter. Many bakers bake their breads with... Time out, time out. I just want to ask... <laughs> I... Are you ready to go there? Because I'm ready to go there. I just want to yes, be sure I'm ready actually. to go there. Um, yes. All right. Yes. So Many because commercial breads, commercial breads are poison. I must tell you, commercial breads are poison. Why? Because a lot of bakers are trying to meet, yes, in trying to meet production costs, they remove, they replace sugar with things like ACK. Some people use aspartame, you know, to sweeten their, their, their batch of, their baking batches. Use do improvers, do conditioners, do softeners, fat replacers. You load up your dough with all these carcinogenic additives and then you increase your yield. It looks delicious. I mean, it smells great. It has a great texture and everything. But then by the time it interacts with your, your bloodstream, you know that you're actually contaminating people's body system. And so many bakers do that. I actually went to Navdak to say, why, why are we allowing these uh, products into us? And one of the things uh, someone said to me there was, you know what, we ban bromates and saccharin. <laughs> we can't ban everything. If you ban everything, you will cause the food revolution in Nigeria. So it's food politics. What they decide to approve or not approve is part of the global food politics that we're playing. And because we, there's a big gap in the supply, uh, global supply chain, value chain, we are just like, we're still colonial, uh, 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 economic slaves because we're not at the table deciding how we trade with the rest of the world and so because of that we need to go back to backward integration we need to start producing eating what we can produce because flour is important it's actually a temperate cereal a temperate grain it's not grown in africa originally if you go to a place like ethiopia you have what they call tef t-e-double-f tef is a grain that's locally grown in ethiopia and that's their staple our staple is wheat. It's wrong because wheat is not produced originally in Nigeria. It's from a temperate environment, you bring to a tropical region. I want to know how you always depend on the countries that can produce it locally. That's what it means. So I spoke to one of their spokespersons. I said, why can't we find a hybridized way of 
maybe bring in for, and I know why government increased that tariff on it to stop us from importing too much. But I say you can't just where in the world have you, has increase in tariff changed, you know, policies or changed yeah, how yeah. things are done? No. Why don't you have an incubation center where we actually test to see what kind of grains we can bring together, locally grown grains? We have Beno is a rich land of grains. I mean, I have some. Can I introduce my cake mixes? Yes, Mama. please. Let, let's let's yeah. see your cake mix. That, that would be nice. Those powder that we from Benue. We actually shipped them in from Benue. One of my uh, EAG members, Onoja, actually helped me with chinere. They brought soya flour. We're trying to we're create, recreate. And I went to Firo, Professor Ajani is also helping me to recreate breads with local grains instead of just okay. enforcing wheat that we can't grow. Yes, they're making a huge effort in growing grains. Do you know that if all the grains you grow in Nigeria is combined and meals, you only get two hours worth of production. Two hours. And we eat this thing every single day. 200 million people. Imagine eating bread every single day. We can't grow the, the grains that we need. But we have other things like um, uh, we have, uh, guinea corn, millets, corn meal. Why can't we find a way of creating a staple from this product? So I'm taking up that challenge with Professor Ajani of Firo to try and see <clears throat> how we can come together and then create something that people can, can eat and then like. And Nigerians too, we have imported appetites. <laughs> if it's not imported, it's not good enough. Also, there's a particular brand of pancake mix right now that is shipped in from Australia. My products are in other formal retail office, you know, in Lagos and Nigeria. What happens is that when that product stock drops, my product sales picks up because, okay, it's not in the market. I ask, like, ask, why do you buy this other brand? Do you know they use sterilized flour to make it? Mine is, my flour is not sterilized. And my shelf life, my product is lower than theirs. There's like 18 months. Man, I don't eat a product that stays 18 months on the shelf. So people need to also change their appetites. I can make all the noise. If you're not changing your appetites, I can't even do business profitably because all I'm saying is just altruistic. And it's not going to convert you or anything like that. But I feel like if we start looking at it's true, why would I buy a product? I, and I challenge every Nigerian out here. You see a product on the shelf, <laughs> 18 months, pancake mix, please dump it. Mine is not 18 months, six months. I use the shelf life of flour, you know, and then sugar as a preservative and all that. Buy my products. Chef Joe's pancake means they're all over the place, you know. Buy those products and taste it and tell me if there's any difference. Um, and you get difference because mine tastes more like food. It doesn't taste like cough syrup or taste like anything that has this aftertaste. Because I use the ingredients in natural state. So I tell Nigerians, why do you want to stop stop on your shelf 18 months before you eat it? It's not good for your health. Eat things that are closer to what they call father and mother, closer to the earth, closer to, you know. And that's why I try to make my products. I can't eliminate uh, preservation completely, but I'm not going to go as far as yeah. sterilizing flour to prepare pancakes. People, but please, Jules, you know, you know what it is? I think you need to read some of the comments. Uh, you, you, there's so many, how do they call it? What's that song? Say, I'm getting vibes on vibes, a lot of vibes from you, which I want to, I want to get in. I know you're, you're, this is so close to your heart because you're you're even closing your eyes as you're saying it. The passion is, is high. You know? The passion is high, Adam. I I think okay. Somebody said, um, Timmy. Hey, Timmy. Oh, this is I, Timmy. yeah, Timmy. I'm, I, we're talking soon. We're talking very soon. You know. So she says uh, you may get have to get into farming yourself. I'd like to just think about that and. Um, and 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 pack it to one side and really think about it and uh, chidima hi chidima welcome she oh. says um gosh she's so informed about her business and oh, that, that yeah. is true yes and uh, Essien had said um great king solomon quote <laughs> that, that is that is my new quote for when i want i have a craving for um oh wow oh, best cake. Oh, yeah <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. And uh, what I want to say is that a lot of the things that you are talking about are things that you think you've, you've told Nigerians and stuff like that, but they're in your circle. Yeah. You know, more people need to know because when we know, many of us, I mean, my dad also died of complications of diabetes, right? He had to have his toe amputated and he also... We saw this very bland diet he was he was on, and then um, 
it, it, it was sad, saddening. I mean, he coached with it for quite a while, but you can tell when the joy goes out of life. I mean, mm. food is important. Yes. If I'd known now what I knew, if I'd known back then what I know now, I'm sure we would have taken different options. But like you said, the, the, there's an uptake on these um ailments i don't i can't i'm not um, a scientist but it is very very um, easy to make a link between what we ingest mm -hmm. you know and um, the things that manifest in our bodies yeah sure you know sure. there is you know, so i think you need to as you're reforming and you're working with these um uh, different bodies to come up with options you you may have to talk a little bit more using your available platforms you know so that people will be um, educated and your message will be amplified because i would prefer to have something that is um uh, i'm not diabetic i'm not even pre-diabetic but it would be nice to have nutri nutri sap right nutri yes. sap it would be nice to have that option so we don't even get to that point and maybe we have a generation two generations ahead that we can educate and start changing the palette a little bit yes. you know yes. so that we can tweak it and we just say okay i want a guilty pleasure or or this one really tastes nice too yeah you know yeah correct so, you know that each, that issue of changing palettes i think one of the things i am also grateful to god for was that i grew up on the farms actually when i was in secondary school my parents every saturday was farm i thought that was life i thought that was how everybody lived their lives every saturday we used to go to the farm my father was a civil servant. We went to the best schools at that time, schools I couldn't even afford. You know, so what my dad did was, you know, was I have to pay school fees all the way. So let's just grow our own food. So that way we won't spend because you have to eat three times a day, you know, and all that. So all your money goes into buying food. So we grew everything except rice, salt, and sugar. Imagine that. So that means yam, onions, every single thing. Tomatoes used to have like baskets full. We'll now boil it, blend it cook it, portion them like purees so that we can preserve because we just wow. waste. You know, there was a lot of post harvest losses. And so where we, did you we grow? To... Where did you grow up? Ilori. I grew up in Ilori. Ilori oh, that's where I did my youth service. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, so so we used to go to the farm, you know, and then when we moved to Shagan Wogo State, it was still the farm. My dad, we had this they call it Okababa, Guinea Kong, who cut it. We, we the kids were like laborers. We would do everything. I hated farm work. Ah! You know, so like, <laughs> but you know, my mom didn't care. Do it. You don't. Eat, don't do it. No lunch. So it was more like trade by butter. Do the work and then leave. You know. So we used to fry our own curry. We have what they call this at I mean, I'm, I'm using all the. I don't know the English name of those things. We fry our own curry. We have the yellow curry. We have the sour curry, and then we do our own fufu. Oh my God, my mom. She's such a hard worker. She's currently in the farm as I, as I speak. She runs my father's wow. plantation. My dad has like 35 acres of oil palm trees that my mom is managing, you know. So my parents are farmers to the core. So we grew up eating wholesome meals. We used to even kill things like uh, what they call wild game, you know, and then we we'll make okay. soup with it. Every, so everything was, so my palate was conditioned to eat food in its natural states. So when I buy cake mixes, I'm like, ah, this tastes like cough syrup. No, it's not, ah, no, 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 no. So you gave me, <laughs> you gave me an idea of how oh my goodness. I can't look at cake mix again. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, said, I didn't grow up, I didn't even grow up eating cakes. So. I mean, my house, well, growing up, cakes cake. Well, cakes was not something that we was carving biscuits. We pour it, you know, we pour it carving biscuits on this white plate. We just put a candle in between it and then go. My mom would just cook rice, pour it in this big tray. Come on, they come and eat rice. So, so we just, it was very rustic lifestyle. So it wasn't like anything so, you know, very contemporary and everything. So me, becoming a baker, those things impacted how I made my cakes. I, I'm like, well, how can I make this taste better? How can I reduce sugar? We have currently, one of the things that we won at a co chocolate chef competition was the fact that I bake my chocolate cake without butter and eggs. It's amazing. People ask me, what do you use? I said, okay, that's my trade secret. You know, but I'm able to do that. And then people who really have cravings, that's why I came up with the name, guilt-free happiness. You can eat our cakes and not feel guilty. Why? Because I am very careful because the sugar level I put, but I must say that I have to use sugar because without sugar, what you have is pizza bread, it's not cakes. So, sugar is what makes cake. Cakes. Oh my god, That's true. <laughs> you're really releasing <laughs> without sugar. We're eating pizza bread, and uh, yeah, you see, just sorry, uh, Timmy just 
echoed. I think you did. She just echoed what I think. You know, he said, I'm not. Oh, we've solved the problem, actually. <laughs> yes, I'm pretty sure it's commercial. But yes, but we actually, we've solved that problem now. Subscribe to our weekly plan. We call it bread, weekly bread enjoyment plan. If you go on my website, cakeflare.ng, click on buff bread, you see the bread basket there, where you subscribe once a week for the bread, or you can subscribe daily if you like. But it's a weekly plan where you you pay for the you buy the bread and then we supply bring it to your doorstep. You know how they used to supply milk, supply door, door to door milk in the US, something like that. So you, you pay for the bread and then it gets homemade, I mean really homemade bread delivered to you. Why I did that model was because when I talk about the hedgehog concepts, where you want to solve a problem. No, 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 you you're, 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 you're not going to the hedgehog concept. How do we <laughs> in Portacot? How do we in Portacot get this bread? I mean, really, I share to me. I share Timmy's concern. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my husband? What's going to happen to my daughter? What's going to happen to my family, my, my colleagues? Uh, now that you've told us what we should or shouldn't eat, I mean, we, we are not going to go back. Hey, no. I can't eat yam, yam chips every day now. Come oh, on, no. help, help a girl. Help a girl. What are we going to do? When are, when are you coming to Port Harcourt? When are you coming to Abuja? You know? Okay, we have a franchise model already. I'm just looking for uh, will be a potential investors who might be keen on. You don't have to have a knowledge of cake making or anything like that. All you just need to understand is the financial model, and then bring in your funds. Be like an allotted stakeholder in the business, and then we can set up the bakery. You can run on autopilot without you being there. All you just check is just press your button. You see how they're selling, and then what we also do is if you want to be a, like an investor in that plan, it means that your social network. Because right now. We moved from the information revolution to the social revolution, where people have yeah. to know people and then buy us towards what they buy. Things like foods and cakes. You want to buy because oh, I know Julia Oku has this bakery in Port Harcourt, and so that's a hint. So, so come on, you guys. So, you know, I, I was just going to tell you, I'm going to talk to you offline after this. You know, <laughs> you know. So it's just a plug and play model. I have family in Calabar. I have family in Abuja. I have family in Jos. I have family. I have family everywhere. In Akwaibo. <laughs> what, what are we going to do? Exactly. So, and, and you know, and the information is there right now. The tools are there. The world, the global village. We really can, we really can spread this new light. It's actually new information. And I've been so afraid. You know, this thing about conditioning, like, okay, don't talk too much. Who is doing it? You're the only one. Are you sure it's okay? But I'm like, no longer afraid. And it was even one of my friends, Timmy, the great writer, who said, Juliet, you're a reformer. You are, yeah. you are you're not inventing new things. You are, you are. You are actually yeah, recreating new yeah. things purposefully. I'm like, oh wow! And that a light bulb went on. Yes, and that gave me some form of validation, unspoken. But like, Judah, you can. And ever since then, I never look back. I don't care if I fail at it. I don't care if I make a mistake. I will keep going because it drives me. I can't sleep. Just like Elon Musk launched space, uh, uh, the rocket into space, and he couldn't. Sleep. I'm like, ah, his own is uh, spacecraft. Mine is bread, flour, anything flour. And mine is you know cakes. You know, so why can't I also make sure I leave my own footprints in the sound of times in this ecosystem. Fantastic. We'll take some comments and a question um, from a CA. He says, so much passion and useful information flowing from Chef Jules. What an enjoyable communicator. What a great communicator. Her enthusiasm shines through. Just brilliant. A thoroughly enjoyable, informative, and inspiring episode. Thank you, Essien. Thank and, you so um, much, Essien. <laughs> Chidima says, I'm so proud that you're a Nigerian. Oh, I am as well. You. And I'm even prouder that she is my friend. You know, <laughs> so proud. Oh, yes. Boy. And um, Ima Abbasi says, we need you in Port Harcourt. Yes, okay. we do. <laughs> uh, before I get to a question, another comment from Chidima. He said, by the way, commercial bread these days is just getting worse. Now I know why. Yes. Um, Chidima, <clears throat> yeah, I agree. But until until it comes until it comes to us, until it comes to us, um, both bakery gets to around the world. Then yes, <laughs> around the around the country first. But Chef Jules, maybe somebody could bring your pre mixes while I I share this question. This is both bread, non commercial, not chemicalized, no additives, wholesome. This is what you should be eating. And I'm not trying to market. I mean, I don't really do marketing. You have honestly, to sell markets. <laughs> but honestly, I mean, you can check the reviews. People who are eating the bread. Those who used to have allergies when they eat this bread, I don't, I don't have those bloaty 
no see effects i used to have when i eat all those breads and make me gas all the time this is really wholesome this is from my soul i mean my kids eat this bread. i see how kids eat bread every day i'm like no my yeah. conscience will allow me to do that chemicalized bread just for profits you know and that's why i said i see hedgehog concepts you know no, where... no, no. We, we need to take this question first um from geraldine she says i'm pre-diabetic and have to watch my blood sugar etc she just joined so how can your products enable me still enjoy but be healthy at the same time so since you just joined us we we, we will go through it briefly because um she had um, mentioned she had talked about it geraldine okay yeah uh, for the uh, diabetic like i said uh we have this innovative breakthrough it was actually my, my award-winning products when i went for nature pitch uh, organized by was Fit Foundation and another uh, Gains Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. They organized a competition called Nutri Pitch, and uh, we had the professor of nutrition who was there, um, Nick Adeyemi, Edio. They were really amazing. They put this pitch together to see that we don't we don't want to just be entrepreneurs. We want to be nutripreneurs, where the food products that we are putting out there, you know, they're wholesome. The things that will not trigger health issues over a long period of time. Because when you eat all these breads, it's not overnight you're going to fall sick. It's over when you're in your 40s, 50s, you start, you start feeling all these things. Oh, you, know, you see growth on your skin, stuff like that. It comes from accumulation of toxins over the years, and your body can process that. Process that. Actually, when you take drugs, you know, what, what happens is that the drugs don't actually, actually cure you. The drugs kind of boost your immunity to cure those diseases. So food is almost like medicine. If you eat wholesomely, your antibodies, they are working on hyperdrive to take care of you. But when you, it's all kind of not so there, you now use drugs to push it. And those drugs will also have their effects over time. So in Nutrisap, we have, Nutrisap, okay, it's finished. Okay, but this is a pack. Okay, don't have that. So Nutrisap, can, we see, run can Nutrisap. we see your range? Can we see your range? Okay, okay, this of is- mixes um, and things, yeah. Okay, we have- The pre-diabetic more than the- um, yes. Okay, this is Nutrisap. Nutrisap is for diabetics. It doesn't use sugar okay. as a sweetener. It uses a uh, coconut nectar that you get from the floral parts of coconut trees. It has a GI of 35. So those who are pre-diabetic or even diabetics can use it to eat cakes or pancakes without spiking their blood sugar levels. And then we have the pancake mix. This is the one I feel like you should take over the Australian brand. Currently. <laughs> <laughs> Not mentioning names, but this is actually very wholesome. You see no sterilized flour and the shelf life works the shelf life of regular flour, which is four to six months. And then we have uh, the chocolate cake mix as well. For those who are decadent, who like to eat wholesomely, have that. And then what else? So six products, uh, chocolate, vanilla, red velvet, allergen free, and then nutri sap. The so, so um, if you're, if you're pre-diabetic or you're very careful about clean eating and you're an advocate for clean eating, wholesome wholesome enjoyments, let me put it that way, yes, wholesome delights, you know. Um, so these things, um, number one, Nutrisap, can you use it to make syrup? Because I love loads of syrup on my pancake. Okay. Um, yes, you can. As a matter of fact, it's sweet now. So you can, it, it, and do you know the beautiful thing about... I believe God has already blessed Africa with all African yeah. needs. You know, this idea of coconut nectar is sugar because it has the same crystalline composition as regular, regular table sugar. The only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't spike up your blood sugar level because of the level of, I think, glyceriderides in the stuff. I see, I'm still investigating why is this thing not spiking? And it, I think coconut is the next superfood. It has everything you need or wholesome uh, well-being. I mean, it's it's medicine on its own, just taking coconuts. I know how in Nigeria right now we take every part of the coconut tree except the nectar. Why? Because of the culture around this cultivation. You have to tap it every two hours and convert it to granules. Otherwise, you cannot sweeten. So it has a, it has a timeline for which you can actually process it to become much sugar. So you see that thoroughness, that detail, that... It's not a cultural thing in this part of the world where people can just spend time. And because the farmers too, they are subject to the elements of, of climates and then seedlings. The seedlings that you have right now, Las Coda is working very hard. And I commend them in that area, trying to grow seedlings that can start producing fruits in less than two years or three years. 
that will really help us because right now what they have is that the old rights that take five years for it's too long so if you even and also if when you start sapping the next half of coconut trees it shortens the lifespan so it's almost like a short therapy for the trees and so instead of staying like five six years it shortens it by maybe 25 percent so they need seedlings that can replace all that intervention so that there's no gap once you have that gap then you know you're, you're going to really suffer so many of these farmers don't want to subject their trees to that kind of short therapy and then who will buy these things and also pharmaceutical companies use coconut nectar to make drugs so what they do is they actually okay. go to java there's a place called java in indonesia where they get that's actually where this thing started from they are well developed in the culture of tapping coconut nectar to make sugar that diabetics can actually consume but the problem is that we have not been able to replicate that borrow that idea and i love what the americans did they went out went to Ethiopia took TEF. Do you know right now there's a company called the TEF company? This is in America. They grew a temperate. I don't know if uh, Ethiopia is kind of so sub Saharan Africa is temperate, it's not temperate, it's still a tropical region. But they were able to grow TEF in America, in Iowa, in North Carolina. They, I mean, there's a company now run by one lady called Caroline. She's the one who actually took the initiative, went all the way. I'm thinking, okay, Caroline probably has patient capital <laughs> to invest in that long term project, you know. And I try to also put what out there. Okay, fine. Don't let me be the only stakeholder. Join me. Let's go on this thing. Let's let's be like our legacy uh, work that we can also do for Nigeria beyond just making profits. To see how we can also grow local local grains or even even that same teff because teff is gluten free. It doesn't contain gluten at all. Grow that here in Nigeria and find. You no, know, I believe that the world is in perfect synergy. If you can just make it, connect the dots, I am very sure that we can come up with a Nigerian grown staple or Nigerian grown wheat that does not depend on all those strict conditions. And you know what's going on right now? The wheat yeah. that is milled is bought by some powerful corporations. So that way they dictate the price and all of that. So it's still so much politics going on. I am also ready to create politics. Let's play good politics, where people who are growing these products, they are also very well paid, you know, and they're not beginning to replace Absolutely. flour with all those things, and then make it, make, it's also profit oriented. Let us be well. When we are well, health is well. It's not about just making money. Not make all that money. Not going to spend out in a hospital and all of that stuff. We can live richer, fuller lives when we don't make so much profits, but we just make enough to get by and then live happy lives. So I feel like that is the problem we have right now. Nigerians also need to change up three things: change your appetites, read labels. Don't just buy. If you see the name is one, two, three, diet protein, it's not good for you. Be able to read what's on the label, flour, sugar, butter. Don't read things that, you know, uh, don't buy things that when you see the label, you're not sure what it is. But it tastes great anyway, and then just buy it. Because you're going to... And for Jules, we that. need people like you to tell us what those things mean. Because we can read them. That's why I said there's a whole lot of education that requires, uh, needs to be done. Um, you have the information. Maybe there are people who, I mean, we have a Timmy here. They are great communicators. I mean, I can help amplify your message, but I need to know what that message is to amplify it, to break it down, to help people, to help people know. So while you're operating at a high level, other people have to cascade. So there's a whole value chain for for yeah. a revolution to happen. Yeah, mm. there'll be there'll be um, an arrowhead, but there are other people who have to form the value chain. But sure. we we have we have like five minutes left. Oh because wow! Start right on time. Oh yeah, I told you it goes fast. You know, it goes fast. But let's take a couple of comments. Uh, this is from Pagabi. Hi, Pagabi. Says I'm very wary of things that have a, a long shelf life. Not happy with pres preservatives. Your pancake mix has six months shelf life. Does it have natural preservatives or chemical ones? If natural, which I hope it's okay to ask. Okay, oh, go ahead. I mean, on the pack, I don't preserve the ones I sell in Nigeria. We're currently uh, also in Accra, Ghana, somewhere in East Legon. We're trying to also get into ShopRite, Ghana as well. And um, the products are, you know, we're trying to ship them across the globe. There's what they call sorbate. Sorbate is a natural occurring compound that can be used for preservative, for preservation, actually. It's, it's, it's healthy and wholesome. But also, even that one, the shelf life, it depends on the quantity you're going to be using as well, you know, because the more you preserve, the more you add to the product to preserve it, the, uh, it's, it's not really about preserving the food, it's about the quantity you're using to also preserve, you know. We have some that are carcinogenic, and now that too is trying. Let's not 
also on the play what they're doing because in the whole of Nigeria, you only have about, roughly about 2,000 NAVDAC staff. How can they enforce and regulate the industry? It's difficult because you don't have the capacity, you don't have the resources, even the labs to test. Sometimes you, you queue months and months on end to, re, to, to test your product for them to get validated. But they've improved that now. I mean, within 60 days, you can get your NAVDAC uh, certification on your products because the VP stepped in during COVID and said, look, let's, anything has to do with food, let's make sure we give it attention. And that really happened. My pancake means I got the number within 60 days. You know, so it was, I was really, really impressed. Even currently right now, I'm helping other entrepreneurs in my EAG to put their uh, labels and CSC documents together. We go and meet one of the officials. Okay, here we are. Help us get this thing verified, certified, and approved. And when we have issues, educators don't just say bye bye go show us what we need to do so we can also conform to global best practices and they're really doing that i mean mr oji thumbs up the guy is awesome i mean he tells you no he's so vast he knows what is right the, your your powder is it e45 no 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 if you're using it it must be two percent you know he knows the rules he, they are so informed the issue is b2 let's not be afraid this is really good to know Let's go and meet really, really really them. Educate us. Yes. I mean, I, I tell you, they even invite us to the stakeholders' meetings because when you make policies, we have to be there to say, sorry, that's the like room. That. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you ban room. this one, what are we going to use? If you increase tariff, what are we going to use? So even P ban, which was, uh, although I left the group shop because it became more like we're buying flour and sugar. I want to change the price of flour. I want to change how you grow it. You said we should start using cassava to make uh, bread. I'm thinking, how now? Show us. Talk about taste, talk about texture. Let's let's do full pro concept. Don't just ban things, don't just increase tariff. Talk to us, we the producers, the consumers, then you the policymakers, let's sit together. They have an incubation center. They tried that with Firo, and many of us don't remember. Our problem is that we're always trying to also make profits. So we're not really taking time. Or because we don't have proper corporate governance in our businesses, you know, we're not able to leave the business and work on it. We're always in it, and that sucks up energy, time. And that wealth of information that you have, knowledge, you're not able to use it to better other people beyond your pockets. And so we need to also take time to go and visit Firo. Just say, hello, my name is this person from this company. I want to just know what you guys do. How can you help my product? This is what I do. Show, give them a document of what you do. Go to Firo. I challenge you. Just go there. They'll be open. Firo is a beautiful place that's not doing 10% of what you should do. But you I need know? to stop you. Okay. I need to stop you because I need to ask. We have, we have, we have, we've actually gotten to the top of the hour but there was wow. something that we, we we talked about behind the scenes and um which i haven't mentioned here i hope i have your permission to mention because you have three brands you have buff this jewel you have cake flair and chef jules africa and you're planning to exit yes Yay! okay i'm so excited <laughs> okay so can we talk oh yeah she has a website I'll, I'll, I'll type it now but um while while we're typing that um let her talk about her exit strategy because many brands start and they don't want to leave they they, they die there like they say in nigeria we die here you know so yeah. talk to us about your exit plan and why you have to have an exit plan why i am super excited about this particular one what happened is you know what i'm doing currently or trans transitioning into right now is a combination of what cake flair has brought me into and it's called femix Female Enterprise Export Group. Because of the gap, the supply, global supply chain gap I see within African products and the rest of the world, I thought, why can't we ship to the rest of the world? Why can't we also have African brands that are in America, like you have McDonald's? Why can't we have a cake flare? Why can't we have that all over the place? Currently, I also stock Badagi Jam. Let me show that hmm. to you. Badagi Jam. By a fellow Femix member, I don't know if you can see that. Okay, well. the jam. fantastic. This is the best jam in the world. I'm not kidding. I'm not even marketing. As in, it's the best jam in the world. And I'm actually giving one for free to anyone in Lagos who, you know, no, 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 to us in Portacos. You can't do that to us. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, so Femix is a group of women coming together to say we want to take our products to the rest of the world. Let them experiment and exper experience African products. He has purple, uh, purple African tropical fruits, not even strawberries. I mean, purple, mango, uh, oranges, and even pina colada. That's pineapple and coconut mixed together. It's amazing. Mm. You know, I also have agroin sauce. We're out of stock of now on agroin sauce as well. You can eat that. If you're in the diaspora, you can make that smoky thing. Just buy the sauce. It tastes natural. And they don't have all those 
uh, carcinogenic additives that I'm talking about. These are all products that we carefully verify to be on our platform. And we're also currently on Pendify. Pendify is a B2B marketplace platform that helps us take our products to the rest of the world. So Phoenix is a group where women can, who have can, products. Can you um, spell that? Is it Splendify? What was it called? Splendify. P-L-E-N-D-I-F-Y. Plendify. So if you're a small business okay. owner, you don't have a big corporation money, just be on Plendify. I'm actually the ambassador. I said, guys, I can promote this thing for you guys because I see the power that you have. AFCFTA, the African Trade, uh, African Trade, this protocol, AFCFTA, it's very lengthy. You know, it's a trade protocol that was enacted by the uh, AU to help Africans do inter-country trades without uh, tar tariffs. So it's a tariff-free trade agreement. So they have protocols in place to teach you how to trade with other African countries. And so because you can't have feet on ground in every country of the world, Blendify is a platform, they act like an e-agent to help you move your products, like our breads or our cakes or our cake mixes or our jams and all of that to other parts of Africa. So they can experience what Nigerians can produce. If you go to a country like Uganda, for example, what you see our products are from America. Things like, I, can't, I don't mention their brands. You know, you see the, all the American brands, European brands, you will see things like buff bread or buff or cake flair or chef jewels or even badagri jam, you won't see it on those shelves. Why? Because you don't have the right distribution network and chains to help push those products there. So Blendify is a platform where you can actually put your products uh, and then wholesale, not just one one, you can a ton, you can move it and they have a partnership deal with THL at a, that's a ridiculously low price to ship your products to those countries and they have agents waiting for you to take your products in and then put on their supply chain, their there are retail outlets out there. And so that's how you can spread something like Badagri. You're not going to hear it in Uganda. You hear it in South Africa mm -hmm. because platforms have been put in place to help facilitate that. So my job in Femix right now is to help female entrepreneurs who have products that are exportable to be on the global map. So that's why I want to exit Cape Flair, not 100% per se like that, but I'm not going to be operationally active there. But the principles are there. We've already automated it. We already have our corporate governance that we're tweaking daily to ensure that it can run without me being there. I'm not going to leave until I'm sure that it's going to be done. And I have a timeline, so I'm not going to be there. So uh, as I'm doing that, I'm moving to Femix so that I can also help push those brands you know, to, to outside the globes and be like an ambassador for African brands that can compete. I want to kind of level that. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like this. I want to kind of try and bridge it. Maybe not here, but at yeah. least bridge it a little bit and close that yeah. up so that we can actually start sitting at the table with these people and then command some respect as Africans. Because let me not lie to you, the wealth of the West is built on the backs of African products. Coco, Absolutely. I like well, Chef, I, Chef Jules, I, 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 I'm going to stop you, I'm I'm stop you for a minute. Chef Jules, I'm going <laughs> to stop you for a minute. I'm going to stop you for a minute. I think this is another case of um, we, we, we've really gotten into the heart of the matter and um, one hour is obviously not enough, mm. but one hour is um, we need to keep people thirsty for more. You know, it's to keep people thirsty yeah. for more. Yes. Yeah. So I, I don't want to stop. I'm sorry for for stopping your flow, but um, <laughs> okay. it is, like other people have said that you really do know your terrain and everything, you know. So, um, but I don't know about the ranch, but well, think about <laughs> it. You know, I, I feel oh, wow. that, you know, there's nothing that stops and I can stop an idea that whose time has come. Mm. You know, and mm. many of us, many of us have truly suffered either ill health ourselves or we've cared for people who suffered ill health. And um, maybe that's we, we are that tipping point. But let me show you something else. Um, oh, is this it? Oh no, 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 not this. She's loving her energy. We're all loving. We're all loving her. Thank you, Pagebi. Now, somebody asked, Pagebi asked again, do you have an agent in UAE? Um, I'll let you can you be that. my agent in UAE? More like, can you be my agent in UAE? Please, please tell us in the comments section if you if you're ready to be her her agent in the UAE. I am thinking about we we should get an agent in Portaco because girl, I don't know how I'm going to face that bread again. <laughs> but in the meantime, I think I oh she says yes. So oh, awesome. we'll talk. So I'm going to I'm going to get okay. Chef Jules, tell me what number you are happy to um to share openly. Oh. Okay, and today I will share my number with you. So she has the number. Okay. So I'm I'm on the website I'll, I'll as well, yeah, I've, I've let me post the website again. 
and my, and my Instagram handle, Cake Flair. The, the contact yeah. number there is actually my direct number. Okay, so please check uh, IG. Instagram. Uh, I'm Cake typing Flair. the same. Oh, oh, yeah. At Cake Flair. And website is. Um, Cakeflare.ng. Okay, yeah, cakeflare.ng. Cakeflare.ng. Yes. Okay, Chef Jules, before we go, okay, another comment. You have so many admirers on this. Mm. <laughs> I could listen to Chef Jules all day. This is absolutely fabulous. Oh. I'll be looking up her website later. Wonderful episode. Thanks so much, Julia and Chef Thank Jules. You. Thank you. Very well done. Many thanks for such a fabulous episode. And um, Thank you. the last thing I like to ask people, you know, our guests is like, what four things would you um, advise, questions, anything you'd like somebody who has built a brand? You've built a brand for how long? How long have you been building um, this brand? Since 2003, that's like 17 years or 18 years. It's, whoa. Well, 18 years. I should spend 18 years, of those that's... years at home. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well. Yes. Yeah, but in the came about 20, 2003. Yes, there it was. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So what, what four things would you like people who are starting brands? I mean, the most obvious one is that you need to put your hand on the plow and not look back. Yes. And it's yes. a long, it's a long haul. So yes. please make a difference between there there has to be a differentiator between i'm going to do a quick hustle and get out or i'm going to build a brand and you build you build a brand so what would you advise people i would say well don't be too hard on yourself you have to fail at some point to learn better ways of doing things so allow yourself to fail and then okay. try not to listen to that narrative that puts you in a box and try not to self-sabotage i did that a lot of times you know, that one's about, I'm, you've been doing cakes for how many years? Why, what, we're sleeping, right? Why didn't you bring these things since the year, year one or year two of your products? <laughs> and that's, and that's a question made me think, oh my God, you know, that, she's correct. Why wait 10 years to bring this thing out? You know, we've had the other American brands before you were even born. So why are you wasting 10 years? Because I didn't see any Nigerian product that says I can do cake mix. So I just thought, ah, maybe it's meant for, to come from a whole country or something like that. You know, so, but you know, over time, as I grew more confident, with you know i became more comfortable in my own identity i think that's just it find yourself know yourself find your voice be yourself don't try and be perfect and this peer pressure of trying to conform to what people will accept it really it really kills a lot of female enterprise enterprise owners because we're trying to wait for people to validate us to say go ahead or you know and that can also hold you back always looking for what is right trying to don't rock the boats don't rock that boat, destroy it, recreate your own, because <laughs> the world steps aside for the woman or man who knows where he's going. And that's there a you fine voice. You know? And when you hit a rope, it's something block, like I said, redirect. Don't be afraid to start again. Don't be afraid to change your company. If you like, oh, good time, just keep going. Never stop. Because if you stop to think too hard, you give up. Just keep doing. Be crazy. Because that's what it takes, actually, to be able to be a tool, prim and proper, to conform, to you know, be eccentric a little bit. That does with eccentricism really helps you to push beyond the narrative that has been put there from time memorial. You need to break it. That's why you're an entrepreneur. That's why you are the one that sees light where others see darkness. So please give yourself permission to fly. Give yourself permission to fly. And the world steps aside for a man or a woman who knows where they're going. Yeah. Guys. Whoa. We could do this for almost another hour, ah, I, I, I tell you, you know, I can tell you for free that when we were doing the technical rehearsal for this, Chef Jules and I talk, spoke for one hour, it was supposed to be like five minutes, but we spoke for one hour, you know, that's how much passion she is, she, passionate she is about what, what she has, and then I'm happy to, your know, story is getting, getting told. And um, I'm happy that you also accepted to be on the Julia Jacks platform where we tell brand stories. And guys, I'm watching you. You haven't followed our YouTube channel. I'm, I'm watching you in 3D. I'm just watching you. It's okay. <laughs> you know. Yes. 
Yes, she stretches me, Maxio. Yes, Maxio SME desk. So you stretch me anytime I listen to you. Oh, wow. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. Thank um, you so much. That's very encouraging. It's important that um, iron sharpens iron. You know, when, when you're just with people who who just clap for you. I mean, that, that's the applause section. And the applause section has its has its own um, yes. merits. You, you, you need the critics' corner as well. The people mm -hmm. who will tell you, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And yeah. um, oh, Absolutely. Well, you know, Chef Jules, I don't know. You need to give me another oh. date. People are saying, please do oh come my. back, Chef Jules. More, more, more. <laughs> you, you need to, you, I need oh, to hold no. you down now and give you another date. So please give me a date in, in 2023, in 2022. <laughs> okay, my God's when, grace. When, when will you come? Will you come in January so I can invite you again? By that time, you and Pagebi have hooked up, so we, we'll be listening to a hookup story as well. Yeah, we'll share that offline and let them know. <laughs> okay, so we will, but she will. I'm sure she will come back. I'm sure she will come back. I want to thank you. This is the most I've gone over the hour, and um, knowing me and knowing you, we could we could do this because I'm not tired. I haven't even listen. There's so many things I've written down here. We didn't talk about the hedgehog concept. We didn't talk about the Yeah. Concept. Okay. So you need to come back and hear about the hedgehog concept, guys. <laughs> Listen. Let me just write it here. You know. And not ever tell us that we don't. We don't give you value. Listen. We've heard about um, what is it? Conditioning. What What was that thing that you said? My goodness. I have learned so much here. <laughs> we've heard about the conditioning. Contribution ratio. We've heard okay. about the hedgehog concept. We heard about so many things. And guys, I'd just say, you know, widen your circle. Learn a few more. L learn to be vulnerable. Open yourself to learning as much. You know, don't be afraid to hang out with people who, and go up to people who you looked at with big eyes. I mean, they're human beings. They'll be happy to learn and mentor you. You know. A candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. Mm. There's just more brightness in the room. Mm. There's just more brightness in the room. So please learn. Please um, share. Because when you share, it gets ingrained in your mind. And then um, you also move and make space for other people. Jules, I'm so happy our paths crossed 20 plus years ago. I'm really Thank happy you. that our paths crossed. You're one of the you people know? who spoke to me and woke me up from my traumatic states. I'm really grateful to have someone like you as my mentor. I really appreciate you, and I hope I made you proud. You made me extra proud. I mean, I could cry. Proud mama. I could. I just could cry. You know. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. <laughs> well, I wear my glasses too, so let's do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody who who joined us live, and for everybody who would um, watch the replay. Thank you. Please watch the replay on um, Julia Jack's consulting on Facebook and also on YouTube. Uh, let's help herself. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week when we are going to still on the food chain. They're talking about chocolate. So join us. Okay. Take care and bye. Jules, bye. Chef Jules, bye. my Chef Jules. I love you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>